Book twenty, chapters twelve through nineteen of the City of God. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darren L. Slider, www.logoslibrary.org. The City of God by Saint Augustine of Hippo, Book twenty, chapter twelve. The words, And fire came down out of heaven, and devoured them, are not to be understood of the final punishment which shall be inflicted, when it is said, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. For then they shall be cast into the fire, not fire come down out of heaven upon them. In this place fire out of heaven is well understood of the firmness of the saints, wherewith they refuse to yield obedience to those who rage against them. For the firmament is heaven, by whose firmness these assailants shall be pained with blazing zeal, for they shall be impotent to draw away the saints to the party of Antichrist. This is the fire which shall devour them, and this is from God, for it is by God's grace the saints become unconquerable, and so torment their enemies. For as in a good sense it is said, The zeal of thine house hath consumed me, so, in a bad sense, it is said, Zeal hath possessed the uninstructed people, and now fire shall consume the enemies. And now, that is to say, not the fire of the last judgment. Or, if by this fire coming down out of heaven and consuming them, John meant that blow wherewith Christ in his coming is to strike those persecutors of the church, whom he shall then find alive upon earth, when he shall kill Antichrist with the breath of his mouth, then even this is not the last judgment of the wicked. But the last judgment is that which they shall suffer when the bodily resurrection has taken place. CHAPTER thirteen. This last persecution by Antichrist shall last for three years and six months, as we have already said, and as is affirmed both in the book of Revelation and by Daniel the prophet. Though this time is brief, yet not without reason is it questioned whether it is comprehended in the thousand years in which the devil is bound and the saints reign with Christ, or whether this little season should be added over and above to these years. For if we say that they are included in the thousand years, then the saints reign with Christ during a more protracted period than the devil is bound. For they shall reign with their king and conqueror mightily, even in that crowning persecution, when the devil shall now be unbound, and shall rage against them with all his might. How then does scripture define both the binding of the devil, and the reign of the saints by the same thousand years, if the binding of the devil ceases three years and six months before this reign of the saints with Christ? On the other hand, if we say that the brief space of this persecution is not to be reckoned as a part of the thousand years, but rather as an additional period, we shall indeed be able to interpret the words, The priests of God and of Christ shall reign with him a thousand years, and when the thousand years shall be finished, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. For thus they signify that the reign of the saints and the bondage of the devil shall cease simultaneously, so that the time of the persecution we speak of should be contemporaneous neither with the reign of the saints nor with the imprisonment of Satan, but should be reckoned over and above as a superadded portion of time. But then in this case we are forced to admit that the saints shall not reign with Christ during that persecution. But who can dare to say that his members shall not reign with him at that very juncture when they shall most of all, and with the greatest fortitude, cleave to him, and when the glory of resistance and the crown of martyrdom shall be more conspicuous in proportion to the hotness of the battle? Or, if it is suggested that they may be said not to reign, because of the tribulations which they shall suffer, it will follow that all the saints who have formerly, during the thousand years, suffered tribulation, shall not be said to have reigned with Christ during the period of their tribulation, and consequently even those whose souls the author of this book says that he saw, and who were slain for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God, did not reign with Christ when they were suffering persecution, and they were not themselves the kingdom of Christ, though Christ was then pre-eminently possessing them. This is, indeed, perfectly absurd, and to be scouted. 
but assuredly the victorious souls of the glorious martyrs having overcome and finished all griefs and toils and having laid down their mortal members have reigned and do reign with christ till the thousand years are finished that they may afterwards reign with him when they have received their immortal bodies and therefore during these three years and a half the souls of those who were slain for his testimony both those which formerly passed from the body and those which shall pass in that last persecution shall reign with him till the mortal world come to an end and pass into that kingdom in which there shall be no death and thus the reign of the saints with christ shall last longer than the bonds and imprisonment of the devil because they shall reign with their king the son of god for these three years and a half during which the devil is no longer bound it remains therefore that when we read that the priests of god and of christ shall reign with him a thousand years and when the thousand years are finished the devil shall be loosed from his imprisonment that we understand either that the thousand years of the reign of the saints does not terminate though the imprisonment of the devil does so that both parties have their thousand years that is their complete time yet each with a different actual duration appropriate to itself the kingdom of the saints being longer the imprisonment of the devil shorter or at least that as three years and six months is a very short time it is not reckoned as either deducted from the whole time of satan's imprisonment or as added to the whole duration of the reign of the saints as we have shown above in the sixteenth book regarding the round number of four hundred years which were specified as four hundred though actually somewhat more and similar expressions are often found in the sacred writings if one will mark them chapter fourteen after this mention of the closing persecution he summarily indicates all that the devil and the city of which he is the prince shall suffer in the last judgment for he says and the devil who seduced them is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone in which are the beast and the false prophet and they shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever we have already said that by the beast is well understood the wicked city his false prophet is either antichrist or that image or figment of which we have spoken in the same place after this he gives a brief narrative of the last judgment itself which shall take place at the second or bodily resurrection of the dead as it had been revealed to him i saw a throne great and white and one sitting on it from whose face the heaven and the earth fled away and their place was not found he does not say, I saw a throne great and white, and one sitting on it, and from his face the heaven and the earth fled away, for it had not happened then, that is, before the living and the dead were judged, but he says that he saw him sitting on the throne, from whose face heaven and earth fled away, but afterwards. For when the judgment is finished, this heaven and earth shall cease to be, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. For this world shall pass away by transmutation, not by absolute destruction. And therefore the apostle says, For the figure of this world passeth away. I would have you be without anxiety. The figure therefore passes away, not the nature. After John had said that he had seen one sitting on the throne, from whose face heaven and earth fled, though not till afterwards, he said, and i saw the dead great and small and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of the life of each man and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their deeds he said that the books were opened and a book but he left us at a loss as to the nature of this book which is he says the book of the life of each man by those books, then, which he first mentioned, we are to understand the sacred books, old and new, that out of them it might be shown what commandments God had enjoined, and that book of the life of each man is to show what commandments each man has done or omitted to do. If this book be materially considered, who can reckon its size or length, or the time it would take to read a book in which the whole life of every man is recorded? shall there be present as many angels as men and shall each man hear his life recited by the angel assigned to him in that case there will be not one book containing all the lives but a separate book for every life but our passage requires us to think of one only and another book was opened it says 
we must therefore understand it of a certain divine power by which it shall be brought about that every one shall recall to memory all his own works whether good or evil and shall mentally survey them with a marvellous rapidity so that this knowledge will either accuse or excuse conscience and thus all and each shall be simultaneously judged and this divine power is called a book because in it we shall as it were read all that it causes us to remember that he may show who the dead small and great are who are to be judged he recurs to this which he had omitted or rather deferred and says and the sea presented the dead which were in it and death and hell gave up the dead which were in them this of course took place before the dead were judged yet it is mentioned after and so i say he returns again to what he had omitted but now he preserves the order of events and for the sake of exhibiting it repeats in its own proper place what he had already said regarding the dead who were judged for after he had said and the sea presented the dead which were in it and death and hell gave up the dead which were in them he immediately subjoined what he had already said and they were judged every man according to their works for this is just what he had said before and the dead were judged according to their works chapter fifteen but who are the dead which were in the sea and which the sea presented for we cannot suppose that those who die in the sea are not in hell nor that their bodies are preserved in the sea nor yet which is still more absurd that the sea retained the good while hell received the bad who could believe this but some very sensibly suppose that in this place the sea is put for this world when john then wished to signify that those whom christ should find still alive in the body were to be judged along with those who should rise again he called them dead both the good to whom it is said for ye are dead and your life is hid with christ in god and the wicked of whom it is said let the dead bury their dead they may also be called dead because they wear mortal bodies as the apostle says the body indeed is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness proving that in a living man in the body there is both a body which is dead and a spirit which is life yet he did not say that the body was mortal but dead although immediately after he speaks in the more usual way of mortal bodies these then are the dead which were in the sea and which the sea presented to wit the men who were in this world because they had not yet died and whom the world presented for judgment and death and hell he says gave up the dead which were in them the sea presented them because they had merely to be found in the place where they were but death and hell gave them up or restored them because they called them back to life which they had already quitted and perhaps it was not without reason that neither death nor hell were judged sufficient alone and both were mentioned death to indicate the good who have suffered only death and not hell hell to indicate the wicked who suffer also the punishment of hell for if it does not seem absurd to believe that the ancient saints who believed in christ and his then future coming were kept in places far removed indeed from the torments of the wicked but yet in hell until christ's blood and his descent into these places delivered them certainly good christians redeemed by that precious price already paid are quite unacquainted with hell while they wait for their restoration to the body and the reception of their reward after saying they were judged every man according to their works he briefly added what the judgment was death and hell were cast into the lake of fire by these names designating the devil and the whole company of his angels for he is the author of death and the pains of hell for this is what he had already by anticipation said in clearer language the devil who seduced them was cast into a lake of fire and brimstone the obscure addition he had made in the words in which were also the beast and the false prophet he here explains they who were not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire this book is not for reminding god as if things might escape him by forgetfulness but it symbolizes his predestination of those to whom eternal life shall be given 
for it is not that God is ignorant, and reads in the book to inform himself, but rather his infallible prescience is the book of life in which they are written, that is to say, known beforehand. CHAPTER Sixteen. Having finished the prophecy of judgment, so far as the wicked are concerned, it remains that he speak also of the good. Having briefly explained the Lord's words, These will go away into everlasting punishment, it remains that he explain the connected words, But the righteous into life eternal. And I saw, he says, a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and there is no more sea. This will take place in the order which he has by anticipation declared in the words, I saw one sitting on the throne, from whose face heaven and earth fled. For as soon as those who are not written in the book of life have been judged and cast into eternal fire, the nature of which fire, or its position in the world or universe, I suppose is known to no man, unless perhaps the divine spirit reveal it to some one, then shall the figure of this world pass away in a conflagration of universal fire, as once before the world was flooded with a deluge of universal water. And by this universal conflagration the qualities of the corruptible elements which suited our corruptible bodies shall utterly perish, and our substance shall receive such qualities as shall, by a wonderful transmutation, harmonize with our immortal bodies, so that, as the world itself is renewed to some better thing, it is fitly accommodated to men, themselves renewed in their flesh to some better thing. As for the statement, And there shall be no more sea, I would not lightly say whether it is dried up with that excessive heat, or is itself also turned into some better thing. For we read that there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, but I do not remember to have anywhere read anything of a new sea, unless what I find in this same book, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. But he was not then speaking of this end of the world, neither does he seem to speak of a literal sea, but as it were a sea. It is possible that, as prophetic diction delights in mingling figurative and real language, and thus in some sort veiling the sense, so the words, and there is no more sea, may be taken in the same sense as the previous phrase, and the sea presented the dead which were in it. For then there shall be no more of this world, no more of the surgings and restlessness of human life, and it is this which is symbolized by the sea. Chapter 17 And I saw, he says, a great city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, but neither shall there be any more pain, because the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. This city is said to come down out of heaven, because the grace with which God formed it is of heaven. Wherefore he says to it by Isaiah, I am the Lord that formed thee. It is indeed descended from heaven from its commencement, since its citizens during the course of this world grow by the grace of God, which cometh down from above through the labor of regeneration and the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. But by God's final judgment, which shall be administered by his Son, Jesus Christ, there shall by God's grace be manifested a glory so pervading and so new that no vestige of what is old shall remain. For even our bodies shall pass from their old corruption and mortality to new incorruption and immortality. For to refer this promise to the present time, in which the saints are reigning with their king a thousand years, seems to me excessively barefaced, when it is most distinctly said, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, but there shall be no more pain. 
and who is so absurd and blinded by contentious opinionativeness as to be audacious enough to affirm that in the midst of the calamities of this mortal state god's people or even one single saint does live or has ever lived or shall ever live without tears or pain the fact being that the holier a man is, and the fuller of holy desire, so much the more abundant is the tearfulness of his supplication. Are not these the utterances of a citizen of the heavenly Jerusalem? My tears have been my meat day and night, and every night shall I make my bed to swim, with my tears shall I water my couch, and my groaning is not hid from thee, and my sorrow was renewed. Or are not those God's children who groan, being burdened, not that they wish to be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality may be swallowed up of life? Do not they even who have the firstfruits of the Spirit groan within themselves, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of their body? Was not the Apostle Paul himself a citizen of the heavenly Jerusalem, and was he not so all the more when he had heaviness and continual sorrow of heart for his Israelitish brethren? But when shall there be no more death in that city except when it shall be said, O death, where is thy contention? O death, where is thy sting? The sting of death is sin. Obviously there shall be no sin when it can be said, Where is? But as for the present, it is not some poor weak citizen of this city, but this same Apostle John himself, who says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. No doubt, though this book is called the Apocalypse, there are in it many obscure passages to exercise the mind of the reader, and there are few passages so plain as to assist us in the interpretation of the others, even though we take pains and this difficulty is increased by the repetition of the same things, in forms so different that the things referred to seem to be different, although in fact they are only differently stated. But in the words, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, but there shall be no more pain, there is so manifest a reference to the future world and the immortality and eternity of the saints, for only then and only there shall such a condition be realized, that if we think this obscure, we need not expect to find anything plain in any part of Scripture. Chapter 18 Let us now see what the Apostle Peter predicted concerning this judgment. There shall come, he says, in the last days scoffers. Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. There is nothing said here about the resurrection of the dead, but enough certainly regarding the destruction of this world. And by his reference to the deluge he seems, as it were, to suggest to us how far we should believe the ruin of the world will extend in the end of the world. For he says that the world which then was perished, and not only the earth itself, but also the heavens, by which we understand the air, the place and room of which was occupied by the water. Therefore the whole, or almost the whole, of the gusty atmosphere, which he calls heaven, or rather the heavens, meaning the earth's atmosphere, and not the upper air, in which sun, moon, and stars are set, was turned into moisture, and in this way perished together with the earth, whose former appearance had been destroyed by the deluge. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Therefore the heavens and the earth, or the world which was preserved from the water to stand in place of that world which perished in the flood, is itself reserved to fire at last in the day of the judgment and perdition of ungodly men. He does not hesitate to affirm that in this great change men also shall perish. Their nature, however, shall notwithstanding continue, though in eternal punishments. Someone will perhaps put the question, if after judgment is pronounced the world itself is to burn, where shall the saints be during the conflagration, and before it is replaced by a new heavens and a new earth, since somewhere they must be because they have material bodies? 
we may reply that they shall be in the upper regions into which the flame of that conflagration shall not ascend, as neither did the water of the flood, for they shall have such bodies that they shall be wherever they wish. Moreover, when they have become immortal and incorruptible, they shall not greatly dread the blaze of that conflagration, as the corruptible and mortal bodies of the three men were able to live unhurt in the blazing furnace. CHAPTER Nineteen. I see that I must omit many of the statements of the Gospels and Epistles about this last judgment, that this volume may not become unduly long. But I can on no account omit what the Apostle Paul says in writing to the Thessalonians, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, etc. No one can doubt that he wrote this of Antichrist, and of the day of judgment, which he here calls the day of the Lord, nor that he declared that this day should not come, unless he first came who is called the apostate, apostate to it from the Lord God. And if this may justly be said of all the ungodly, how much more of him? But it is uncertain in what temple he shall sit, whether in that ruin of the temple which was built by Solomon, or in the church. For the apostle would not call the temple of any idol or demon the temple of God. And on this account some think that in this passage Antichrist means not the prince himself alone, but his whole body, that is, the mass of men who adhere to him, along with him their prince. And they also think that we should render the Greek more exactly were we to read not in the temple of God, but for, or as the temple of God, as if he himself were the temple of God the church. Then as for the words, And now ye know what withholdeth, that is, ye know what hindrance or cause of delay there is, that he might be revealed in his own time, they show that he was unwilling to make an explicit statement, because he said that they knew. And thus we, who have not their knowledge, wish, and are not able even with pains to understand what the apostle referred to, especially as his meaning is made still more obscure by what he adds. For what does he mean by, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now holdeth, let him hold until he be taken out of the way, and then shall the wicked be revealed? I frankly confess I do not know what he means. I will nevertheless mention such conjectures as I have heard or read. Some think the Apostle Paul referred to the Roman Empire, and that he was unwilling to use language more explicit, lest he should incur the calumnious charge of wishing ill to the empire, which it was hoped would be eternal, so that in saying, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, he alluded to Nero, whose deeds already seemed to be as the deeds of Antichrist. And hence some suppose that he shall rise again, and be Antichrist. Others, again, suppose that he is not even dead, but that he was concealed that he might be supposed to have been killed, and that he now lives in concealment in the vigor of that same age which he had reached when he was believed to have perished, and will live until he is revealed in his own time and restored to his kingdom. But I wonder that men can be so audacious in their conjectures. However, it is not absurd to believe that these words of the Apostle, Only he who now holdeth, let him hold until he be taken out of the way, refer to the Roman Empire, as if it were said, Only he who now reigneth, let him reign until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed. No one doubts that this means Antichrist. But others think that the words, Ye know what withholdeth, and the mystery of iniquity worketh, refer only to the wicked and the hypocrites who are in the church, until they reach a number so great as to furnish Antichrist with a great people, and that this is the mystery of iniquity, because it seems hidden. Also that the apostle is exhorting the faithful tenaciously to hold the faith they hold when he says, only he who now holdeth, let him hold, until he be taken out of the way, that is, until the mystery of iniquity which now is hidden departs from the church. For they suppose that it is to this same mystery John alludes, when in his epistle he says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. 
As therefore there went out from the church many heretics, whom John calls many antichrists, at that time prior to the end, and which John calls the last time, so in the end they shall go out who do not belong to Christ, but to that last antichrist, and then he shall be revealed. Thus various, then, are the conjectural explanations of the obscure words of the apostle. That which there is no doubt he said is this, that Christ will not come to judge quick and dead, unless Antichrist, his adversary, first come to seduce those who are dead in soul, although their seduction is a result of God's secret judgment already past. For, as it is said, his presence shall be after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all seduction of unrighteousness in them that perish. For then shall Satan be loosed, and by means of that Antichrist shall work with all power in a lying, though a wonderful manner. It is commonly questioned whether these works are called signs and lying wonders, because he is to deceive men's senses by false appearances, or because the things he does, though they be true prodigies, shall be a lie to those who shall believe that such things could be done only by God, being ignorant of the devil's power, and especially of such unexampled power, as he shall then for the first time put forth. For when he fell from heaven as fire, and at a stroke swept away from the holy Job his numerous household and his vast flocks, and then as a whirlwind rushed upon and smote the house and killed his children, these were not deceitful appearances, and yet they were the works of Satan to whom God had given this power. Why they are called signs and lying wonders we shall then be more likely to know when the time itself arrives. But whatever be the reason of the name, they shall be such signs and wonders as shall seduce those who shall deserve to be seduced, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Neither did the apostle scruple to go on to say, For this cause God shall send upon them the working of error, that they should believe a lie. For God shall send, because God shall permit the devil to do these things, the permission being by his own just judgment, though the doing of them is in pursuance of the devil's unrighteous and malignant purpose, that they all might be judged who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Therefore, being judged, they shall be seduced, and being seduced, they shall be judged. But being judged, they shall be seduced by those secretly just and justly secret judgments of God, with which he has never ceased to judge since the first sin of the rational creatures, and, being seduced, they shall be judged in that last and manifest judgment administered by Jesus Christ, who was himself most unjustly judged, and shall most justly judge. End of Book 20, Chapters 12-19 through 19. Recording by Darren L. Slider, Fort Worth, Texas, www.logoslibrary.org.